This is going to be 32-1. We're going to take a look at the extrema on an interval. So the first definition we're going to go over is the definition of extrema. Now this is going to be the same definition that was given to you in pre-calculus. Now the idea is if I have some sort of function and it's on some sort of interval, meaning it has a beginning and it ends, and we know that it's going to contain or at least the value c is defined, then f of c is the minimum if on that interval the y value with that x plugged in is smaller or equal to every other y value. Likewise, I can say it's the maximum if I take that same y value and say that that y value is the largest of all or equal to of all other y values. So the minimum and maximum of function on an interval are the extreme values or the extrema. Now we also call it global maximum or minimums or absolute maximum and minimums. Now we're going to kind of talk about relative maximum and minimums in a second, but just know that when we use the term absolute or global, we're talking about the highest and the lowest values on our graph. And so we can kind of take a look at these sketches here, right? This right here could be my potential maximum. This value down here could be my potential minimum on this graph here. So because it's the smallest out of all the other possible y values. So in this instance, I graphed x squared plus 1 on the interval negative 1 to 2. My maximum value is here. This is the highest value. That's going to be at 2. And then my y value is 5. So the maximum is 5. My minimum is this value here at 0, 1. Now, we have to be careful with our intervals because on this interval for the same graph, it's negative 1, 2. I cannot include that 2 as my x value. So you actually don't have a maximum. And the reason is, is because I don't know how close that gets to. The moment you say, you know, what if you plug in negative point, or sorry, uh, 1.9999999, well, I'm just going to add a 9, and it's going to be even closer. So there's no defined value, exact value that I can pick for x that's going to give me the absolute maximum. Now, the extreme value theorem just states that if my function is continuous on some closed interval, it's going to have both a maximum and a minimum value. They just have to exist. And so I can draw any picture. Now, the moment I say some closed interval, so let's just say it cuts off here and it cuts off here. Well, there's my maximum. And maybe, let's see, what's going to be lowest? Maybe that's my minimum. Those look about the same. So both of those right there would be my minimum. I have a definitive highest value. And then right here and right here, those are my lowest values. Now the definition of relative extrema are very similar to absolute max and min. The difference is on an interval, what we're able to do is we're able to create smaller intervals. So the idea is if I had, once again, my graph, and it looks something like that. Within this graph, I could create an interval and if I can say within this little interval, I have a highest value, then I can say that it's going to be a relative maximum. Or likewise, if I could create an interval, I could say that's going to be a relative interval. Now, the importance of it is we're doing a double comparison test, meaning that if I have some value of f of c, that means it has to be the largest, this is for apps or relative uh, maximums, it has to be larger than all the other values that I pick for x. So if I pick that interval, it doesn't fit this. It doesn't fit the idea that on this side it's smaller and then on this side it's smaller. But if I pick this as my interval, I can conclude that that value there is the highest y value out of all the other x values that I can pick to create those other y values. So that is the highest y value out of those 
other y values that are possible. And likewise, this right here, that would be the, if I create like say that interval, that would be the lowest y value. And so we call that a relative maximum in this instance, and we call that a relative minimum in that instance. The last is going to be the definition of a critical number. And so the critical number is if I have some function and I'm looking at some value c, notice if I take the derivative and set that equal to zero, the values of c are going to be my critical numbers. So the actual values of c are going to be my critical numbers with the derivative, or my critical numbers are going to be where my function does not exist or where my derivative does not exist. Now the reason being is these values represent possible instances in which my slope can change direction. So the intervals of increasing and decreasing, they can change direction at these critical numbers. And so the critical numbers are a function need not produce relative max extrema. They could, but they don't. In this instance, that produced a relative or an absolute maximum. In this instance, it did not. So just know that a critical number or any undefined values, once you, have the, you take the derivative, any undefined values or where it equals zero. So the theorem about those critical numbers, if f has a relative minimum or relative maximum at x equals c, then c is a critical number of f. So it's like almost thinking backwards there, right? Before I said, hey, these critical numbers could be a possible max or min, could be an undefined value we don't know. It's something that we'd have to test. But thinking backwards, if I know that my function has relative max and mins at those values, then I can make the assumption that c is going to be a critical numbers. Now, here are some guidelines for finding those extrema on a closed interval. So we're going to be practicing finding the extrema on the graph. The first thing we have to do is we have to find the critical numbers. So we're going to do that no matter what as the first thing. Then we're going to evaluate the function at those critical numbers. Then we're going to evaluate the function at the endpoints, right? Because if I have some sort of graph, say that's what my graph is, but this is my bound. If that's the case, this is a relative minimum, so that'd be a critical number. That would be a critical number, but that's the maximum, because that's the highest. So when we're trying to find the absolute max and min, you also have to test the endpoints. And then, the smallest of those values are going to be a minimum. The greatest of those values are going to be a maximum. So let's practice these. So it says find the extreme amount of the closed interval when that's my function and there's my interval. So remember, the first thing I want to do says find the critical numbers. So I need to take the derivative. So if I take the derivative, I'm going to get 12x cubed minus 12x squared. Now I want to set that equal to zero and solve. So this is going to be f prime x. So I can factor out, looks like 12x squared. And if I do that, I get x minus one. So x equals zero and x equals one. If you set each of those equal to zero. So these are my critical numbers. Now I also need to test my bounds. So that's what step two and three said. Evaluate my function at the critical numbers and evaluate my function at the endpoints. So now I have to plug in 0, 1, negative 1, and 2 into my function. So here's f of 0. So that's just going to give me 0. f of 1. So that's going to be 3 minus 4. So that's going to give me negative 1. Now I have f of negative 1.
So that's going to give me three, was that plus four? So that's going to give me seven. And then f of two. So 16 times 3 is 48. 8 times 4 is 32. So that's going to give me 12. So it's asking me, find the extrema. So find the max and min. This is my smallest value. This is my largest value. So for my max, I have a maximum of 12 at x equals negative 1, or I can just say it at the point, uh, sorry, max of 12 at x equals 2. And then in my minimum, right, it's going to be a minimum of negative 1 at x equals 1. And so that's at the point 1, negative 1. Example number 4 says find the extrema on this closed interval. So we do the same thing. First thing I need to do, I need to find the critical points. So I need to take the derivative. So simplifying that, you get 2 minus 2 over x to the 1 third. Now, finding my critical values, if I set this equal to 0 and solve, I would then have to subtract the 2. If I were to multiply both sides by that x equals 1 third, Divide both sides by negative 2. I get 1 equals x to the 1 third. I can take the cube root, and you get x equals 1. So this is one of my critical values. The other critical values, if you notice in the very beginning, I had this undefined value. I have x in the denominator. So I actually have to go through, and I have to set that equal to 0. Because that's an undefined value. And so you're going to get x equals 0. So these two instances, these are going to be my critical numbers. So now I need to test my critical numbers. So I need to find f of 1, f of negative 1, and f of 3. So plugging these in, you're going to get f of 1, And I can't forget f of 0. So at f of 1, you're going to get 2 times 1 minus 3 times 1 to the 2 thirds. So that's going to give me 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. At f of negative 1, you're going to get 2 times negative 1 minus 3 times negative 1 to the 2 thirds. So you're going to get negative 2. Well, negative 1 to the 2 thirds, you're taking the cube root of it, so it's still going to be negative. But you are squaring it. So if you square it, you're going to get a positive, And then if you cube root it, so that's going to be negative 5. And then if you plug in 3, 2 times 3 minus 3 times 3 to the 2 thirds. And so this is going to give me 6 minus 3 times the cube root of 9. It's kind of an awkward thing. We're going to enter that in our calculator. So that's going to give us negative 0 0.24. And then we plug in 0, we're getting 0. So the maximum or the highest value that it's actually giving us in this interval actually happens to be at 0 and the lowest value is going to be here. Number 5 it says find the extreme on the closed interval so we have to take the derivative 
So I'm going to get 2 cosine of x. And then plus the derivative of the outside, so negative sine. So negative negative is why I made it positive of 2x times the derivative of the inside. Now we have to set this equal to 0. So I'm going to have 2 cosine x plus 2 sine of 2x. Now the plugging in part, I'm going to kind of leave that to you guys, but I am going to give you guys a hint when it comes to being able to, how do I solve this, right? I have to find my critical numbers. So we're going to have to use identities. And so believe it or not, this sine of 2x, that's 2 sine x cosine x. I know, identities. Oh. So I have 2 cosine x plus 4 sine x cosine x. And so I can factor out a cosine and a 2. That equals 0. So then I have to set my cosine x equal to 0. And I have to set my 1 plus 2 sine of x equal to 0. Now taking the inverse, x equals cosine inverse of 0. So where is my cosine going to be 0? That's going to be at pi halves and at 3 pi halves. Now one thing that we have to double check is notice it says on the interval between negative 1 and 3. The question is, is pi halves and 3 pi halves, is that in that interval between negative 1 and 3? So that's something that you're going to have to enter in your calculator. If I do pi halves, I get 1.5, so that works. But if I do 3 pi halves, that gives me 4.7. That won't work. So this, even though it is a critical number, this value is outside my interval here. So I don't need to worry about it. So, so far, this is my only applicable critical value. Now I need to try the same thing for sine. Minus one on both sides, divide by two on both sides. So you get sine of x equals negative one half. Then you take the sine inverse to both sides. So you get x equals the sine inverse of negative one half. So where on my unit circle is my sine going to be negative one half? And so that's going to be on these here and here. So we're going to have negative pi six, right this way. Um, we also have that value there, which is 7 pi 6. Now, you're probably wondering, like, wait a minute, why not do also 11 pi 6? It's true. I could do 11 pi 6, but this is my interval. And so I know that 11 pi 6 is going to be outside of my interval. I also know that if pi is 3.14, this is larger than pi is. That's outside of my interval maybe negative pi 6 is within the interval, right? Because on, if this is my sine function, well, it moved backwards, right? If that's negative 1. So I have to test that and see if that is going to work. So negative pi divided by 6. Boom, negative 0 0.52. So this right here is going to be my other critical value. So that means the num values that I need to test are my interval and my critical values pi halves and negative pi six so you're gonna test those you plug them in you evaluate into your original and you're gonna see which one is going to give you the maximum or the minimum now to conclude this what are extrema extrema are the highs and the lows of a graph we have absolute extrema which are absolutely the highest and the lowest of our graph the relative extrema are going to be in an interval that we can create in which I can definitively say 
this is the highest and this is the lowest based upon the fact that when I compare that value on both sides of it, my y values are either both lower if it's going to be a maximum or both higher if it's going to be a relative minimum. Now, how do you find them? Those are those four steps. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative and find the values of C, um, our critical numbers, and you find the derivative and you set it equal to zero and solve. Those are our critical numbers. The second thing that you're going to do is you're going to plug the interval in to your original function. You're going to plug the critical numbers into your original function. You're going to test all those. The highest, the highest is your maximum. The lowest is your minimum. This does conclude our lesson. If you have any other questions, please leave them in the comments.